Okay, so um, I'd like to kick off this uh, round table where we're going to be looking at the topic of from promise to practice. How can global leaders demonstrate courage and deliver on commitments? It's been quite an exciting um, five hours uh, from this morning and, and the UNGC's day one of Uniting Business Live. If I just recap on some of the key things that have happened, First of all, in the opening session of the private sector forum, um, the UN Global Compact presented to the Secretary General over 1,000 signatures from business leaders around the world, really recommitting to the spirit of international cooperation and multilateralism. Uh, it was a fantastic show of support and a true call to action by business uh, for the fact that corporate governance global governance, critical issues such as international cooperation, respect for rights, uh, transparency and anti-corruption are critical to moving business forward. Um, after that, uh, the Secretary General then presented the UN 70 at 75 report, which was a global survey of feedback from around the world, generations and countries, really sharing aspirations of what the expectations of the UN at 75 and going forward would be. You know, to highlight just a couple of things from this, great expectation that the UN and its partners should be involved in improving access to basic services, should be involved in driving forward international solidarity, improving health, education and rights around the world, addressing future concerns such as climate change. Um, lots of optimism among, amongst the youth, really calling for the UN to be that vehicle to drive forward their future but also a future that hopefully would be grounded in inclusivity and transparency, and also one grounded in innovation. So um, I'd like to reflect on those two key um, elements of the program today as we go through a series of questions during this round table. And I can see a few more speakers coming on. I will just begin with some introductions of those that we have here. And I will start with, um, Beatriz or B. Perez. B is the Senior Vice President and Chief Communications, Public Affairs, Sustainability and Marketing Assets Officer of the Coca-Cola Company, joining us from Atlanta. Uh, she manage a manages a diverse portfolio of work supporting brands, communities, consumers, and partners worldwide. And prior to this in the green, we were chatting about some fantastic initiatives that Coca-Cola has been doing to keep small, medium uh, enterprises driven by women in business and indeed building their resilience through through the tough times. So welcome, B. Thank you. It's great to Thank have you. you. Then I'd also like to introduce Emmanuel Lulin. Emmanuel is the chief ethics officer of L'Oreal. Um, and he initially joined as a group general counselor, but created the role of group chief ethics officer. It's a widely innovative and visionary docket and approach resulting in L'Oreal being recognized for the 11th time as one of the world's most ethical companies in the ethosphere. Welcome, Emmanuel. Great to have you here from Paris. Thank you. And then we're joined by Inger Anderson. Inger, it's so great to meet you. We haven't had the chance to meet yet formally. We have so many ties. I know that you were also on the UN Global Compact Board before in your previous role at IUCN. You're now the Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. Great to have you here, Inger. I think you're on mute for the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Inger. Uh, we have one more panelist, uh, Ray, who I'm not sure if he's joining yet. When I see him pop up on the screen, I'll certainly introduce him. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're here for this hour to really reflect on um, three key topics primarily, um, tying into the first day of the private sector forum, peace and justice, human rights and development, and the UN at 75. And I'd like to really just kick off with, with a question to, um, I'll start with you, B, if that's okay. Um, you know, we've spoken a lot about the, the UN Global Compact, the work that it does. Certainly Coca-Cola has been one of our longstanding and supporting members and the work that you do is truly holistic and multi-sectoral. But I wanted your view, given what I shared about UN at 75 um, and the calls for increased cooperation and increased um, uh, integration of work with business, how do you feel that businesses can and should get more involved in the work of the UN? And you know, if business had a seat at the table as we reflect on UN at 75, and suddenly UNGC at 20, 
what do you think those negotiations could look like and what role should business play? Thank you, Sanda. And first, I want to congratulate you on the tremendous progress that you and the UN has made in terms of bringing the business leaders together and the enormous amount of passion and energy around signing the recent document to, to show that business does want to collaborate. And it's important to have these partnerships and relationships. And, you know, I think about it in terms of three different areas, and, and I'll weave in some of our discussion from our Women's Economic Empowerment Program. But I look at it in terms of purpose, proof points, as well as partnership. And so let me start with purpose. I think it's important for all of us to understand the why we all exist. The UN, as we know, is an, is an amazing collaborator of governments from around the world who share common issues and solutions for their, their societies around the world and have common goals and initiatives. The SDGs and having the 17 SDGs with 169 targets is an example of how important it is to drive these key initiatives and start to show progress against them. But the most important part was the understanding why it is important in the role that business, the UN, society all play in working together and that accountability. And if I go to proof points, it's so how are we going to measure and track against the 169 targets or 17 SDGs? We know that not everyone will deliver on each aspect because going back to the purpose and the why, it also means what role can you play and what's credible within your space. The proof points, we have to be able to have data and collect data and be highly transparent and report it out. That means that sometimes we're going we're gonna to report out where we don't always do well. And so sometimes even, you know, Coca-Cola, we publish an annual business and sustainability report. While we're very proud of progress around the programs like empowering 5 million women by 2020 and we're at 4.6 million women in over 75 countries so we're excited we also know that there's a, there's other areas where we have to improve if you look at our goals around creating a world without waste and and helping to improve the plastic pollution issues we know that we have a lot more work to do in that space but we have to be transparent we have to set the targets together and work together as organizations business society and the un working in partnership we have to then be able to report out and the data has to have integrity and have third parties to independently review it. And we can't be afraid that we're not always going to find things that that work. We're going to have to innovate. We're going to have to move forward and we're going to learn sometimes through those failures, which will create breakthroughs for us on the other side and partnership. These are big and important tasks that we all have at hand because the world, people and society and our planet's at stake. And that's, that's, that's a big, you know, it's a big undertaking that we all understand. And so everyone here listening today and everyone on this panel absolutely understands that. And we know that we can't do it alone. And so having competitors work together, we work directly with competition because we view that these initiatives are pre-competitive space and that the work we do in water or empowering women or eliminating plastic pollution issues, it's critically important to the world. And so we put aside the competitive areas of our businesses and share the common goals. You know, on human rights, we are, we're running our 12th annual human rights conference at Coca-Cola, where we bring in external stakeholders to talk to our system and other employees, as well as other business partners who share common interests in how do we progress on human rights. And we're excited that that's, that's coming up. So during the pandemic, we said we have to accelerate the work. We know that this is a very difficult time. Congratulations on running this whole week through video conferences and doing what we can to get people connected and to keep the work moving. And we, we recognize the same. And so finding new innovative ways to create those partnerships and to continue moving forward. So thank you for having me here today. We're very proud of the work we've done with the UN. I just have to also give a quick shout out to UN women who you all might remember the work that when we started the initiative around empowering 5 million women by 2020, we worked with UN women to help us to define what did that actually mean. So, and we, that's when we settled on economically empowering and making sure that the woman who was empowered in year one was still thriving and doing well by year 10. And it was really the partnership with the UN that helped us to accelerate and build partnerships all around the world. So thank you for that partnership as well. And we really appreciate the work that the UN has been doing. Great. Thank you, Dean. I, you know, I, I hear um, links back to a lot of the sustainable development goals as, as you talk about the work that Coca-Cola is doing. So I would want to say that I think the SDGs are of great relevance to at least your business 
and the work that you're doing. Allow me to just welcome one of our um, distinguished panelists who's just joined. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ray McDonald. Sorry, Ray McDaniel. He's the president and the CEO of Moody's Corporation. Ray, thank you for making the time to join us. Just a little bit about you. You're responsible for all the activities of the corporation in its two operating divisions, the investor service and the analytics service. And, you know, you're credited for improving professional practices in the ratings business through credit policy, rating committee enhancements and improvements to credit research capabilities. Thank you for making the time to join this conversation. We're reflecting on um, the statement from business leaders that was presented to the Secretary General earlier today, also reflecting on the UN at 75 report that really looks at what the future of the UN should be. I also see Roberto Marquez joining. Um, I'll introduce him when he when he comes on. So so thank you, B. Allow me to just segue on your your work around uh, the SDGs and bring Inger into this conversation. Inger, I mean, you're heading up the UN Environment Program, and as we said, you know, business. The the core for the SDGs is to have business at the table. From the UN Environment perspective, how do you think business can and should get more involved in the work of the UN? Well, first of all, congratulations uh, for all the wonderful work that you do, Sandra. It's a uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to to be here with you and with the with the with the partners who are in this panel. The first thing I'd say is, look, the SDGs. Some work prior to COVID, and good number of the SDGs were actually progressing, but the environmental ones were regressing to a large extent. We're not meeting our commitments in Paris. We're not meeting our biodiversity commitments. We're not meeting our commitments on pollution. So that's sort of where I come in. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the mood dampener here, but that means that we are not doing as much, essentially, as we should. Essentially, we're facing these, this triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate, the crisis of lost nature, and the crisis of pollution and waste, right? And each of these lie within the collective responsibility, business, government, individuals, consumers, etc., to solve. And all the business who've signed up to the Global Compact are on the group that is seeking to lead in. And so we're really looking at this group that has now mobilized for the statement of business leaders to be that group, to put up the hand and say, we can do better, we can stretch further, we can go faster, we can do more. And I think, I mean, there's so many dimensions to this, but the WEF report of last year, we all saw it, all the high risks were clearly those of environmental dimensions. And, and, and we just can't, and, and just COVID-19 is obviously a disease that jumped from nature into human health uh, in part because of mismanagement. So, and if we just look at, at this week's Economist, it speaks to these four reasons why businesses should care about climate change. I won't go into it, but it's very clear that we need to take action at this time with the stimulus package of this of amounts that nobody could ever imagine would go from the public purse to the private, uh, but, but well-reasoned, don't get me wrong. We have the once in a lifetime, once in a generation, probably once in, I hope, many generations, opportunity to not continue business as usual. So we at UNEP are calling up bailouts, but with green strings attached. Investments that must be uh, with, with taking nature and nature-based solutions, sustainable agriculture, renewables, conservation, green infrastructure into account. Loan and grants for green investment, but not for the gray investments. Green R&D subsidies, reinforcing environmental legislation, not black backsliding on it, and ending fossil fuel subsidies and levying carbon taxes. Each of these can actually help to shift. And when the private sector becomes part of the chorus that calls for some of these, even though maybe it might appear as if a short-term revenue might be uh, under duress, but those forward-looking businesses understand that long-term revenue is in a much better place, well, then uh, politicians will also hear. And we're already seeing shareholders actually voting with their feet in a number of businesses demanding a degree. And this, and this is of course great, um, but uh, we're also seeing great CEOs just leaning in and taking it forward. So I think that we are on the way, but we still, unfortunately, for the environmentally related SDGs, have a long way to go. 
Yeah. No, no, thank you, Inga. I, I want to bring in uh, Emmanuel, Ray. Do, if you have any comments or, or builds on this question, I've heard investments come up, I've heard finance, I've heard climate justice. Uh, like just, uh, more as an ethics officer, I think one of the one of the uh, issue is um, uh, to make sure that we understand that we have to on, uh, on the individual behavior, not only of corporation, but also of uh, everyone within corporations and organization. It's a question of sincerity. Sincerity, uh, I think, is becoming a, a very substantial and important concept. Um, it, and uh, in in the way that. Uh, um, we focus and we discuss a lot about few uh, ideas and values. We talk a lot about integrity, we talk about courage, about respect, we talk about uh, integrity. These are values, of course, but they, they are uh, also individual virtues. But maybe we should uh, contribute to change the way we look at them by saying, well, it's not only individual uh, virtues, it's not only values, but it should be decisions in the sense that there is no courage if there is no uh, courageous decision, there is no integrity if there is no integrity in decision in the sense, in the sense that, for instance, you, we cannot say courage is only an individual virtue. Courage should be a decision and integrity in the way we operate should be a decision as well. Um, it is also maybe a way to um, introduce this idea that uh, when we talk about uh, ethics and ethical behavior, uh, we are talking about the ability of an organization to generate trust. As an organization, as a business, we need the trust of uh, all our stakeholders. We need the trust of our employees, of course. We need the trust of our shareholders. We need the trust of the suppliers. We need the trust of the clients, etc., etc. We need the trust of the board. And the ability of an organization to generate trust is critical to maintaining its license to operate. Of course, we can generate a lot of trust with a big lab, but this is short-term view. So we should measure the ability of an organization to generate and maintain trust over time. Absolutely. And it is, uh, I suggest that uh, that's something we haven't focused yet uh, enough at the moment. It's a way to, um, to supplement the usual way of uh, assessing an organization, we look at the statutory accounts, okay, we look at the value of the table, the chair, but it means nothing in terms of sustainability. While the ability of an organization to generate trust over time is probably uh, a great, one of the great indicators of its sustainability. Absolutely. And thank you, Manuel. Ray, you, you must have something to say at this point, given all the work that you've done at Moody's and, and business. And what really is important for business at this point in time in the history of the UN? Well, for us, it's uh, we want to be... Really Ray, if Ray could, could just chip in at this point in time, I'll get back to you, Manuel. And Ray, you're on mute at the moment, if you could turn on your microphone. Are you able to unmute? I don't think I can do it on this end. Um, can't hear you at the moment, Ray. Okay, let's see if he can uh, fix it in, 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 as, as we get along. Because I'd really love to hear his perspective. We talked about a whole range of new indices, trust being one of them. We also talked about investments. Inga raised the, the question of investments um, uh, from business and, and green investments and all that sort of signaling. 
So um, I'd, I'd like to just come back to, to all of you on the question about the spirit and the commitments that were made in the statement from business leaders. We talked about the importance of international cooperation, of anti-corruption, of uh, addressing social injustices, um, and really putting these elements into business operations. So let me start again with you, B. I mean, what does this mean at a practical level for, for companies? How can they truly embrace and demonstrate outcomes from the statement of business leaders? I think I'll just I'll add to and your own. Is this better? Yes. So I'll add to what Inger said, which is this is also not just about the short term. This is about driving long term growth. And businesses who move into this space actually are going to be delivering on what consumers and society is asking them to deliver on. So we as business have to reinvent our business models or reinvent what how we operate in terms of delivering on what society and our consumers expect from us. And we have to take accountability to also help to shape and drive that change. And so we take a look at the commitments that have been made that really align very well with the Coca-Cola company values. And if I can give just a little bit of a quick history lesson to show you that, you know, since 19, so it's 1934 when Coca-Cola put its first women, woman on its board of directors, Letty Pate Whitehead Evans. It's 1934. Robert Woodruff, the chairman and CEO at the time, if you go back to read our minutes, which are in the archives, that was something that I found fascinating. Didn't appoint her just because she was a woman. He appointed her because she was the head of our international bottling operations. And she had a really unique understanding of what people in the households wanted because she could, she could look at the data from the household purchases from other women. And she had that perspective, the diversity and the perspective. She was the first woman on our board. She was the first woman that we could find recorded on a public board of directors. And it's interesting because if you look at that deep history, it also, I believe, is why Coca-Cola has been able to take a step back and think through what is the business data that we're looking at in front of us and what does society expect and how do you bring that together in a values-based organization? And so fast forward to today, we were last December, James Quincy, our chairman and CEO, was looking at our company purpose and mission. It's to refresh the world and make a difference. But for employees and for the public, it didn't really explicitly help them understand what did we mean by that. So he did the double click on it to better explain it, which is in line with where the statement and the requirements and, and the targets that we've set, which is how do we create loved brands for people in a sustainable way for a better shared future? And we believe that that better shared future is going to drive growth for us, not just in the next quarter, but for the next quarter century. And we believe that that is really powerful for us to understand that that also requires changing how we design some of our policies, setting publicly stated targets, measuring and tracking, innovation, investing, to make sure we're really doing the right things in terms of the investment structure. As we started to launch our focus around world without waste and the circular economy, we started to also partner with our bottling system to invest in circular economy facilities where once we collect the bottle, so a consumer drinks a Coca-Cola, puts it in a recycling bin, we pull it back out, out of the system, hopefully it does not end up in the wrong place. If it does, we have collection programs that we partner with industry on, but we get it back in and we found that in certain places, there weren't a lot of facilities for that. Actually, one of them is, is right there in France, and I got to visit it just this past year before all the lockdowns took place. And it's really amazing because the bottles go back there, it gets recycled and created to another bottle. So we have several countries today where 100% of our packaging is, is in 100% recycled PET. That took innovation, it took investment, it took the understanding that this can also drive growth when we tell that story. So that's the next part of this journey, which is as we partner with others to deliver on those goals, and as we put the infrastructure in place, how do we make sure that people know the work that corporations, the UN, that society is driving in order to, to make meaningful change? Because we're, we're running out of time, number one, if we're not making these investments, I think you said it very well, we cannot wait. We cannot fall backwards in terms of the environmental space. We cannot do that for our planet and for people. At the same time, business will miss a significant amount of growth if they're not out there working in these areas in a meaningful way and being honest and transparent about 
where they are and what else needs to be done and how much are they learning and, and being honest about the failure as much as the success. And so I'm excited that you were able to launch this today and get the business community to sign on because as we know that this is a time for all of us to recommit. So at Coca-Cola, we've been committed, but it's also a key reminder that it's time to recommit, to do more and to not settle for the successes we've had in the past. How can we continue to improve? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Vian. And let me check and see if Raymond um, is able to, to join us now in the conversation. Ray, um, are you with us? Excellent. We can hear you fine. Some, some magic behind the scenes uh, uh, took care of that. Great. Thank you so much. So great to have you here with us. You share your thoughts. We've, we've talked a lot about business, about trust, about shifting investments. I, you know, my question to you would be really, uh, given the statement that we that we uh, presented to the Secretary General about renewed international cooperation and and just a new new role for business. How does that sit from where you sit with Moody's? What is really important for business at this point in time? Well, from where we sit, um, it's very interesting because um, we are essentially in the assessment business risk assessment, um, and uh, historically that's been credit risk assessment. Um, you know, will, uh, uh, will borrowers pay on their obligations? The questions being asked now are changing. Investors want different questions answered before they are willing to invest. And this has to do with our, the, the um, institutions they're investing in, the people they're investing in, um, are they acting in sustainable ways? Are they acting in ethical ways? Are they acting in ways that are going to um, allow the investor to have a more holistic understanding of the behavior of the business? And, and is that uh, behavior consistent with what are now the emerging priorities of the rest of the marketplace? Um, it was a lot simpler uh, making um, uh, decisions as a business um, when the only thing you had to do was, was consider the financial, direct financial implications um, as opposed to uh, the, the broader, um, use the word holistic, um, set of, of responsibilities and obligations and accountabilities that are now being placed on businesses by other businesses. Um, and supported by policy making institutions, supported by regulatory institutions. It's a very different, it's, it's exciting, um, the opportunities that this, this presents, but it's a very different world from the, the particular chair that I sit in than it was even five or 10 years ago. Thank you, thank you, Raymond. And I, I, I certainly hear those sentiments. Um, trust being one one of the key issues that, that always comes up. You know, the declining trust in business and institutions, and 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 really the the request for investors, as you say, to have that holistic perspective. I wonder if I could just bring Inga in again and and ask you around. Um, again, I I'm flipping the question from from a UN and a business angle. You know, so you saw our, our statement of, of cooperation, a renewed global cooperation. Again, from your view within the UN, what do you think business needs to do to ensure this success? Well, I think that a lot is already happening, but obviously we still have quite some, some way to journey. I, I, I think Raymond, or Ray, uh, if I may, um, made a uh, really point here. It is about uh, what is it that investors seek and what is it that customers expect and where do you get the regulatory setting and frankly what do staff want, where do staff want to work staff want to work in a place that has ethical values right so that's staff it's very hard to attract and keep staff in a place that has immoral or unethical values so that's on the staff side but on the other side i think investors more and more look at Yes, uh, temporal dimensions to their investments, clearly, but also the ethical dimensions. They don't want to be caught out. And I think the more, um, and, and you mentioned really about regulations. I mean, obviously, um, there was a time when businesses, some businesses, railed against regulation. But I think there is an understanding now that regulations is a great equalizer. And therefore, this is what you have to do. 
at the national and at the regional and the global market. And and I have spoken to many CEOs who says, let's get those regulations in place, point in place on plastics, right? Get some of the regulations in place so that there's standardized collection points, standardized whatever systems, etc., standardized uh, expectations. And so where business is seeing this opportunity and where business is putting up their hand and say, we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. That's where we can see forward moving. We at UNEP have been, I'll give you just two examples. Uh, we established from 10 years ago, UNEP FI, the UNEP Financial Initiative, which you may know. And last year at the General Assembly, we established the principles for responsible mm -hmm. banking. This is, now we have some 47 uh, trillion in assets US dollars in assets signed up. So we are going to seek to realign our investment portfolio to the SDGs. It won't happen overnight, but that's how it is in business. But you can stretch them to 2030, and it is with that transparency. A second point that I wanted to mention as an example, we saw the catastrophic dam failure in uh, a number of countries, for example, Pumadinho in Brazil, with a tailing dam that collapsed and washed out and many people got killed with, and, and Brazil is not alone. There are many countries where you have tailing stamps. Together with the mining industry, together with um, principles for responsible investment, uh, we sat down and we've now, at, as UNEP, with the partners from the industry, worked out a new global standard for how to deal with my, uh, tailing stamps. Is this kind of where you see business and then you create a level playing field? This is the standard you need it or you don't. And eventually, we see international legislation, I expect. Back over to you, Sandra. Thank you. Thanks, Ingen. Those are really poignant and, and really um, fantastic examples of, of the shift. You know, we um, also earlier today launched um, uh, our principle, our CFO task force principles, really calling for a way in which we need to shift um, both SDG financing as an important thing and signaling to investors and doing a lot more holistic reporting. So also within the Global Compact, we're very cognizant of, of that shift that needs to happen and the very important role that CFOs can play, play in this. So um, that's just a great and poignant reminder. Um, let me uh, move to another question and topic around human rights. Um, you know, as, as we spoke about the um, the statement and talked about the primacy of, of rights and we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And we note, as is the case with you know, a lot of the work around sustainable development, I think, highlighted it. There's a lot of a lot of work to be done. So 90% of our global compact participants report having human rights policies in place, but only 18% actually conduct human rights impact assessments and really drive tangible action and outcomes. So what can businesses do to ensure that policies and planning give way to urgent action? I'll kick off with human rights and kick off with Emmanuel, but I ask all of you to, to jump in and just share from your, your perspectives around how do we really move from, from policy and commitments to action? And we can focus on human rights, we can certainly focus on, on other areas. So Emmanuel, let, let me kick off with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandra. I try to respond to uh, your question. Your question, and I just see on the on the chat uh, that there is a question uh, apparently for me. What is the key indicator figure that is currently driving the business case for sustainability at L'Oreal? So I'll try to answer both uh, at the same time. Um, well, it starts with. Um, it starts with education uh, internally. We spend a lot of time um, educating between brackets or raising awareness and sensitivity about uh, human rights uh, issues. At every, and we do it at every level of the corporation. We do it in factories. We do it uh, in um, uh, with management. We do it with employees, whatever the, uh, the responsibility. We think it is key to be very uh, practical, bottom line, down to earth, and uh, to talk about uh, the truth and to have open discussion about this issue. And it helps us to, um, to, to, to drive a commitment from uh, the workforce uh, all over the, the, the world 
in favor of uh, human rights. We have published a number of uh, policies. We have published a general human rights policy, but also we published at the beginning of the year an employee human rights policy. This is a bit uh, less, uh, less uh, common that gives the uh, rights directly to, to employees and it is subject to, uh, to, to a lot of discussion. We organize discussion, debate within the corporation so that people participate. We have every year a so-called ethics day. Hopefully it's not the only day in the year where we uh, behave ethically. But during ethics day, we have uh, <clears throat> about uh, a bit less than 90,000 employees worldwide who can ask questions uh, directly oh. to the and uh, they can ask, they ask uh, challenging questions, tough questions, and they get a direct answer. So we, we, we try to leave, um, to leave our values, sort of. Um, for instance, all questions asked by employees, whether they are coming from, uh, from uh, South Africa, from Asia, from, um, they come from, from everywhere, from, from Brazil, from Russia, from the US, from European countries. All the questions are put online. Um, we do not select the question. All the employees can see the questions. They vote for the questions they want to be answered first. And the president commits to answer to the first uh, 50, 50 questions. And we take also questions live. Um, all these type of exercise shows a sort of sincerity on the part of management. It, is, uh, it was hard for a senior manager to be in front of all the workforce and to answer questions directly on all types of issues, including, of course, uh, human rights challenges we have um, as a business. It is a way uh, for the organization itself and for members of the organization to assess our own uh, sincerity. And we ask uh, straight questions also. You feel free to speak up. And we put the answers uh, with no filter um, online. If you want to assess the culture of an organization, if you want to assess its ethical culture, and you can ask only one question, I would suggest that it is the best question to ask. You feel free to speak up without fear. And it works very well both in public and private organizations. And we put the results online, and people can comment about the, the results. Um, it is uh, on, the, on the part of the management, it's a type of courage. And by showing themselves courage individually, they, uh, they encourage the courage of others. So once again, courage uh, is not uh, an idea, is not a value, is not only an individual virtue, but it should be a decision. So the way we behave, the way we walk the talk is absolutely critical, uh, and that's what uh, needs to be measured, because we measure, uh, I would say, too much um, how many uh, commitments we sign, how many charts uh, of ethics or whatever the name we sign. Uh, what is key is how much we walk the talk and how much we walk what uh, we sign. And it's hard to measure, because then, uh, of course, we, we start to lose, uh, to lose friends. But we make other friends that may be more critical on the journey and long, long term. Um, so it's a, it's a choice, and it's a choice uh, every organization has to make. And uh, it's, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard, and it's hard for the UN, or it's hard for Global Compact maybe to make this choice as well. The journey is, uh, is not an easy one. Um, well, th thank you, Manuel. Let me, you know, you, you sit at L'Oreal and Beha sits at, at Coca-Cola. Thank you, Roberto. I see uh, Roberto Marquez has just joined us from Natura. I hope he can hear us. But, you know, the three of you represent significantly large businesses, significantly large businesses. And I, you know, I wanted to hear from you, Emmanuel, because, you know, on the line, we have a global audience. We have representatives from medium-sized businesses and indeed the small, small enterprise sector. You know, again, I go back to the question.
question, you know, 90% of Africans will say that they conduct, they uh, uh, appreciate the importance of human rights policies and practices, but only 18% really conduct these assessments. So what, what could you say to companies that are smaller, perhaps less well-resourced? Is this something they can afford to do? And, you know, we've got to play the devil's advocate here because we do want to see that shift in the world. Well, it's probably not, it's not, uh, I don't think it's a question of resources. It's more a question of uh, mental and psychological resources, whether we want it or not. And uh, we can do it uh, probably uh, as, a, as a medium-sized corporation. There are many things that can be done. They can be done locally. They can be done with a local network. A wonderful uh, global compact uh, network. I can talk about the French one that we believe is uh, probably uh, it's hard to say it's one of the best. I think it's one of the best, but it's uh, probably in other countries are also uh, best sort of, but I think there are many resources locally, there are many people that are willing to, to help. We should seek um, their advice, their help to, uh, to take initiatives with the local NGOs, uh, within the corporation to once again, to walk the talk is the first thing to do be, be, um, before, we try to outreach uh, lo lo very far issues. We should certainly start with uh, issues that are next to our door. And uh, that's why it starts, because it's all about sincerity. So if we don't have, we can have sincerity with uh, people and subjects that are far away. Uh, it is necessary sometimes, but it, is, it starts with uh, within our reach, immediate reach. And uh, I would say, uh, start modestly, but to start uh, locally and modestly, you need to have the strong commitment and the strong uh, conviction of uh, the senior leaders in the organization. If uh, there is no, uh, if the senior leaders in an organization are not willing to walk the talk, it's better to, to keep quiet and to say nothing. It's less destructive, I would say because to, uh, to take a commitment and not respect it is only much more, uh, much more destructive. Then, uh, I, we, then I think it is uh, useful to understand that um, it is not because we respect the law that it is enough. We can do a lot of things that are perfectly lawful, but awful. And the whole purpose of what we are doing is to make sure that we do nothing awful especially among the lawful things. And it's uh, absolutely key. And I think that's the whole purpose of uh, what we are trying to achieve all together is to make sure that we don't stop and by the respect, the mere respect of the law, that we don't think that because we, we do things legally, we're authorized to do them, that it is perfect or that it is ethical. Nothing is more wrong than that. What we need to address is the awful part of your own behavior and make sure that we avoid it. Thank you. Uh, and it is a more difficult debate because it is less objective. Um, but I think it's uh, our, the, the honor of uh, human beings and institutions to address areas that are beyond the law. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Let me just check if Roberto Marquez can, can hear us. Roberto is the CEO of Matura. Roberto, are you with us? Yes, finally. Ap apologies for the technical difficulties, but I've been trying to solve the technical difficulties and listening very carefully all, all what uh, this great panel has been uh, saying those, thus far. So uh, thanks for having me. Great, thanks, Robert. I'll just I'll just jump right in with a question for you uh, in the interest of time, also. So, you know, um, Roberto, we've been talking a lot about um, the uh, UN seventy five future looking statement, as well as the um, statement of business uh, leaders calling for renewed international cooperation. You know, if I could just say, why were those two, um, you know, components of today's program important to Nature, and why should they be important to businesses as a whole? If you could just share your perspective. Yeah, so Senna, again, you know, it's great to be here and, and, and especially in this moment uh, that we are going through, right? More than ever, and I think, you know, dialogue and events like this one is critical, uh, way almost like a call to action for a more collaborative and more multilateral approach uh, as we think about the world coming out of this pandemic. 
there are daunting tasks ahead of us. Uh, and it, there is no way that we're going to be able to solve uh, if we go back to a unilateral approach by specific sectors, either in, in civil society, government, or even in private sector. It is important that we come together in a more unified way to find the answers. Uh, it is also, in our point of view, very critical, very important that we establish clear metrics and targets and goals uh, for the next, uh, you know, five years, the next decade. Uh, so we are very much aligned with the Global Compact, you know, uh, 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 guidelines and as well as targets. And, and as Emmanuel was talking about, which I also agree, it's also important to hold people accountable. Um, you know, at Natura & Co, one of the things that we try to do is make sure that sustainable goals and our targets that are now are part of our 2030 commitment to life, it's part of the compensation of the senior executive. As much as it is when you drive, you know, bottom line profit or where you gain market share, as important to make sure that we get to a net zero carbon emission, that we get to gender equality, that we get to more inclusive workforce. And, and those things needs to be working in a very collaborative way. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I would say making sure that they are front and center in the agenda for the board, front and center in the agenda for the senior leaders in the company. Otherwise, it becomes just a parallel universe and we don't actually make enough of a change and move the needle the way we need it, especially as we think about building a, a better uh, a post pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. And I think, you know, we, we follow Natura and the work that it does and, you know, you're a great partner of the compact. So, you know, in terms of time, and I should have said at the beginning, we would have been having lunch if this was the traditional gathering um, in, in, at the UN. So I think we're just about to approach the dessert course. So I'm just going to ask each of you to give me a few of your closing comments from where you stand. I mean, what is, what is really the imperative going forward for, for business, for UN at 75, and amidst the, the very unprecedented times that we find ourselves? And you can approach this either from your area of work or generally in terms of the statements that we have released today. But essentially, what would be your, your parting thought? And you know, I'd allow each of you about two to three minutes to, to share your views. Allow me to start off with Inger. Well, thank you. Um... I think the Secretary General has made it very clear. Um, he is charting a course of what he calls uh, inclusive multilateralism. He's thrown open the doors, uh, Kofi Annan threw open the doors with the Global Compact establishment, but he's thrown open the doors saying, look, if we have to solve these global crises, these global challenges, these global, global um, um, aspects that are coming at us with an ever increasing speed, the only way we can do that is by thinking together. And so the business community that, is, that has stepped into the UN circle, if you like, the business community that is engaging uh, with, uh, with the UN, you are such standard bearers. So um, because you are obviously showing that you are leaning in on the SDGs, et cetera, et cetera. And so from, from the environmental point of view, as I was starting out, and I think Roberto may not have managed to find his way into the call at that time, we're not where we need to be on the environmental dimensions, not on biodiversity and nature, not on pollution and waste and chemicals, not on climate. And so my hope is that if we've learned anything from this COVID crisis, is that we can do what the WEF is referring to as a great reset. Use this crisis, this terrible crisis, for this great reset. And I think that's where the UN comes in. Multilateralism, solidarity, and inclusion has to be that uh, finding solutions that are science and fact based has to be the only way that we can move forward. We are hurtling towards nearly 10 billion on this good planet. We can no longer extract, emit, and pollute our, our way to wealth, and yet we must drive down poverty. So finding that, threading that needle, that's, it, that's the answer. And I'm very, very pleased to see uh, everyone that is here um, uh, leaning in on this. Now we need to see everyone stretch for the new biodiversity targets, stretch 
for the NDCs and, and for what companies can do here and stretch for a pollution-free planet. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. I mean, certainly, as we say, you know, before COVID, there was a climate crisis. The climate crisis is still there and we need to keep our eye very much trained um, on the future. And um, at the Global Compact, as you know, we have our climate ambition, really moving companies towards sticking to that 1.5 degree commitment and, and keeping it right there. So, um, B, share your, share your closing comments with us, please. So, so I'll go back to the word partnership. And I think that Inger said it well, which is, we have to all work together in terms of businesses who even compete against each other, partnering with government, partnering with all the organizational aspects of the UN. You all have really built an amazing structure with the intellectual horsepower as well as the intellectual capability to help us drive new innovative solutions in these types of partnerships and government and civil society. I'd say the most important thing is and I was watching the chat box, is for business to not be afraid to admit when we've also made mistakes. Innovation, success doesn't come from always being perfect and always getting it right. Sometimes it comes from failure and sometimes failures of the past. So there was a lot of commentary in there about recycling. I'm the first to admit that we haven't always been the best company in terms of collecting our waste and making sure it has value and putting you know, really eliminating the plastic pollution problem that exists. So how do we think about using business to deliver on new goals that we've set like World Without Waste, which align very much with the SDGs and with what other businesses are trying to accomplish at the same time for the greater good of society, which ultimately helps business. But if we didn't look at the past and look at where we failed and where we're not doing enough and how we need to transform ourselves and investment choices we have to make, then we wouldn't drive meaningful progress because we wouldn't understand and we wouldn't be learning from those failures. And so I would say that our legacies are too important for the future generations and for the planet. That's what's at stake. And as individuals, I know I've made my fair share of mistakes. I think the most important thing is being transparent, setting the common goals, working hard at them and not being afraid when the failures come. Actually understand, pick them apart, learn from them, and get better and innovations will come and, and, and progress will come as a result. Thank you, B. Um, you know, the, the, the part about uh, making mistakes and moving forward is, is it's, 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 it's honest, it's transparent, and I think it's what every business aims to do around its, its holistic sustainability reporting. But at the same time, as, as Inga says, you know, the time is now. So the question is what really is the path and the clear path the business can take, perhaps the path of least mistakes. Um, let me ask the businessman here. I mean, what, uh, Roberto, what are, what are some of the key strategic imperatives you feel um, Natura must do going forward? Um, as I say, from UN at 75 and the UNGC at 20, what are some of the key imperatives for your business? So, uh, so I would start saying again is to address the climate crisis, right? And, and for us also to protect the Amazon which is very important as a you know, region Brazilian company and is such an important asset for Brazil and for the world. Uh, the second point is we talk about being more inclusive to defend human rights and actually to be a little more humankind. I think this notion of a more, you know, a, a multilateral approach with more compassion, with people really trying to, you know, close some of the gaps in terms of uh, social inequality and, and bring more underserved people, you know, trying to represent the fabrics and the DNAs of the countries in our own workforce. It is one area that I would agree with be that we can and should be doing much more as a private sector uh, globally. And, and the third one for us is to really embrace circularity and drive regeneration, the biodiversity aspect, how we can really guarantee circularity in packaging, you know, in our ingredients. Uh, uh, we absolutely need to embrace uh, those goals uh, uh, as a private sector. We need it to work collaborative. I think if we do that, we're going to drive more innovation. Some people ask me, well, if you do that, how you connect the dots with economic growth and profit? those two things are absolutely interconnected. If we deliver on those things, we're gonna drive a, a mindset of a more innovation within the company. Consumers will actually reward companies that will actually innovate more in those areas. So I think it's super important, but I agree with you, Senna. 
The time is now. Uh, uh, we cannot uh, afford to lose another decade. And we know that this crisis creates, for all the reasons that we know, from a, a huge cost in lives and livelihood, a, a huge setback. Uh, uh, and we needed to make sure that collectively, in a multilateral approach, that we really embrace those challenges together to fight you know, the answers uh, and the solutions that will have a world that hopefully will be more sustainable and hopefully will be a little more just. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Emmanuel, the imperatives for L'Oreal going forward. Oh, we are a big fan of uh, multilateralism. And of course, we love to work uh, with the uh, UN Global Compact to start with, but uh, also with UNESCO, with UNICEF, with UN Women, uh, with ILO. We have a lot of uh, partnerships. We believe that it is uh, important also to concentrate on, on uh, our energy on few projects uh, is, and not disseminate uh, the resources and to concentrate on uh, issues where we can have uh, an impact. And uh, to concentrate on issues where we can have an impact means also if we want to gather the energy within the, the corporation is to uh, concentrate on subjects that are linked sort of to, uh, to uh, our business. And lastly, uh, I would say of that uh, we are thrilled of our cooperation with the Platform 16, which is a peace and justice uh, platform. I think it's a great one. It's headed by uh, Christina Kulias. She's doing an amazing uh, work, collaborative uh, work. And the last comment, I think, is, uh, is uh, I would suggest that we need to concentrate uh, on the inclusion of the new generation. It is absolutely, I feel it is absolutely critical. And if we miss that, we will probably miss uh, building the future because we need them and we need them right now. It means sharing information and probably sharing uh, power as well. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Very powerful, powerful statement. But, you know, as you spoke about the, the future and, and young people, I, I want to come back to Inga on one thing about climate. And Inga, I agree with you. We are far behind where we need to be. How do we translate um, these lofty um, and a lofty and, a, uh, and these ambitious uh, climate targets, uh, sometimes complex jargon, in, into ways that make sense for business? Um, and, you know, how would you guide some of the UNGC member organizations around tackling climate for those that may not be fully aware of the footprint and the magnitude of the work that they, they, they do? Do a carbon analysis. This is quite easy to do. It's complex, but it's not as complex, it's not insurmountable. You do much more complex things in, in your regular business uh, and do an audit of your carbon footprint. Understand from 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 source to 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 uh, to the customer and to the retrieval if there is a recycling dimension to it. And then uh, business uh, link by bi oh, business by business, supply chain by supply chain, deal with the entire supply chain and then see where is it and what can you do to diminish it. You'll be surprised and Coca-Cola is a great example of what you did on water, for example. You really looked at how can you make and you did it from the entire chain to the bottling, washing to the, I mean, the whole, I'm not beer can tell us much more. Do that and, and companies present here have done it for carbon. And then have targets and have the CEO own them. And you know what? Managers will own them right down to the plant manager, right down to the work, to the ordinary person. And become that becomes like the mantra that the company pr projects. And I tell you what, your shares will go up, confidence and trust in your product will go up, and your carbon footprint will go down. And then if there is a year where you fall to publish it and do an analysis of why that happened. So exact to be, be transparent. The science-based targets are out there and are very much applicable and exist precisely so that business can employ them. So it's not on impossible. And there are many good companies, uh, including present company, that is doing just this. And so uh, we at UNEP are happy to work with you on this, but there are many other good people who can do that. Um, and finally, I think uh, it was a little mention out there in the chat. What about SDG 12? 
thank you. Sustainable consumption and production, getting circularity, ensuring that we do not take out of earth and just uh, out of the environment and discard it into the economy. And when we're done with it in the economy, we discard it back into the environment. Therein lies a big part of the solution. I'm aware that we are against the hours. I'll stop now and hand it back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Inga. Thank you. And, you know, to all of you, it's a, a pity that Raymond um, is not able to, to close the call with us. But I just want to thank you for your time. And it's an important moment for the UN Global Compact at our 20th anniversary, but certainly for the UN at 75, as we call for renewed uh, multilateralism, international cooperation, and truly an increased role for business. So thank you to our business leaders here, uh, B, Emmanuel, Roberto. Thank you, Inga, for all of your insights on, on climate and those imperatives that we all must follow. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being great partners and supporters of the UN Global Compact. Have a lovely day. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye.